Next, a session produced by our underwriter. Please welcome Afdel Aziz, author of Good is the New Cool, and Tara Carrero, Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Nestle Waters North America. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hello, can you guys hear us? Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So Afdel and I have known each other for about seven years. We both work together at Heineken USA, and now he is advising us on some of our sustainability initiatives. Uh, but we're here today to actually talk about some of the nuggets of wisdom that are in his new book, Good is the New Cool, with co-author Bobby Jones. So thank you, Aftel, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, you've sat in the same seat as many of us have as marketers working for Procter & Gamble, Heineken, Nokia, Absolute Vodka. Can you tell us what led you to write the book? Sure. I, I call myself a recovering marketer. Because um, I, I got to the point where I was really enjoying what I was doing working for these brands, but there was something missing. And kind of what we noticed about four and a half years ago when we started writing Good is the New Cool was suddenly this explosion of all of these brands who were making money and doing good at the same time. Um, the, the Teslas, the Patagonias, the Warby Parkers, the Toms. And so that intrigued us. And so we went on this four and a half year journey to learn about what was going on inside these brands that was causing this kind of uh, shift to happen. Mm -hmm. And what we really uncovered, you know, even though we went in through the door marked marketing and consumer was a much bigger revolution happening. And the way we kind of contextualize it is if you imagine these kind of three tectonic plates shifting all at the same mm -hmm. time, you have one which is the plate of consumers who now want to buy products and services from brands that are stand, not just standing up and you know, talking about doing good, but actually following through in terms of the products and services they make. Number two, you have employees who want to work for those companies. Increasingly, what we are seeing is a new definition of, of uh, choice amongst talent, especially amongst millennials and Gen Z, is does the work I do contribute to something that can help solve a social environmental challenge? And the third and most, you know, one of the most intriguing things that's been happening this year in particular is investors mm -hmm. who now want to invest in these companies. And you're seeing the rise of Wall Street kind of waking up to the, the huge potential of being able to make money and do good at mm -hmm. the same time. So that whole thesis is happening in real time right now. Um, every couple of months, I, I, every time I think I can't be surprised, something happens which surprises me, like Nike and Colin Kaepernick a few weeks ago, you know. So it's such an uh, inten interesting dynamic space that we're in right now. And that's why we kind of set up Conspiracy of Love as a, a consultancy mm -hmm. to help advise brands and kind of get in the trenches and help them do good and make money at the same time. Let's talk about investors because there's many examples in your book where for-profit companies have baked in the good and they're yeah. actually more successful as a result. The two aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah. It, it, it's really interesting. If you, if you look at it, it, it kind of makes intuitive sense, right? If you're making your products in a sustainable way, if you're using clean energy, it's now cheaper than using fossil fuels. If you're making sure that the uh, employees in your factories are safe and protected, you're not going to get hit with class action lawsuits around sweatshops and things like that. If you make sure that there is you know, gender equality in pay, diversity, all of these are huge drivers to show that um, you know, the more good a, a company tries to do, the more money it makes. And what's been really fascinating is to, so I'm going to turn around to this side of the room because I haven't been talking to you guys, <laughs> hello, um, is, is really kind of seeing things like BlackRock happen uh, earlier this year, which blew my mind. Uh, when it's one thing if there's an ESG fund which is only focused on impact investing, it is a whole other ball game when a 6.3 trillion dollar fund, uh, the biggest asset manager in the world, says from now on we expect that all the companies we invest in show social impact alongside financial returns. Larry Fink is not a hippie by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and to see somebody like that waking up and going, this is the new definition of what we expect in all companies uh, is amazing. And to see, uh, I don't know if you saw a few months ago, uh, Goldman Sachs announced that they were creating a fund based on Paul Tudor Jones, uh, the Just Index. And I remember the headline, it said, um, Goldman Sachs creates feel-good fund. And I, I was like, I have never seen Goldman Sachs in feel-good in the same headline ever. <laughs> so something is going on from an investor perspective. You're seeing this massive uh, kind of you know, 
influx of money in terms of the, the you know, impact investing growing as all of these companies wake up and realize actually the best way to make money in a sustainable long-term way is by partnering with those companies mm -hmm. that, are, that are thinking in that mm -hmm. way. One of my favorite concepts in the book is think citizens, not consumers. Yeah. Why is this shift in mindset so critical, especially as marketers and you know, business people try to drive sustainability through their sure, organizations? Yeah. You know, when you think about somebody as a consumer, it's such a transactional way to think about a human being. Like, this is all I want this person to do is just buy this product. And so our thesis is if brands think about people as citizens with a wide range of passions and causes and th issues that they care about, suddenly you as a brand can have a multi-dimensional conversation with that person. You can think about the problems in their lives that you as a brand can solve. So an another thesis in the book is don't just advertise, solve problems. Get out there and find ways uh, to solve problems. And, and what's really fascinating is now brands waking up to the idea that this isn't just good for your brand equity, you can actually make a lot of money doing this. So the shoes I'm wearing on my feet, I love all birds by the way, but the shoes I'm wearing today are the Adidas Parley for the Ocean sustainable shoes. Mm -hmm. If you guys don't know this story, you should look it up. Adidas made 7,000 pairs of shoes a few years ago. Each pair has the equivalent of 12 plastic bottles of marine waste. Those shoes sold out instantly. This year, Adidas have announced they're making 5 million pairs of these shoes at an average retail price of $220 per shoe. So if you do the math on that, it's over a billion dollars of revenue that suddenly a shoe company is making while solving one of the biggest problems we have, which is ocean plastic. The more shoes they sell, the more plastic that they can take out, and suddenly you have the engine of capitalism focused on solving a huge problem that we have. Mm -hmm. and, and for us, that's a great example of if a brand thinks about somebody as a citizen and uses the power of design and cool to bring them into the story, it can have a huge impact, not just on your brand equity, but also on your bottom line. So we've talked about investors, we've talked about citizens. One of the more overlooked audiences, I think, from my perspective is employees. And in your book, you talk about the importance of empowering your employees to be agents for change within, yeah. from you know, interns all the way to the C-suite. Why is this important? You know, as we worked with all of these companies, we realized it was, there was absolutely no point having a noble purpose if the people in the company don't believe it. Mm -hmm and if it doesn't connect with their own personal purpose as well. And what's really fascinating, and this is gonna be the subject of, of our next book, is really how do you make that connection between a personal purpose and an organizational purpose? If you look at all the data, it doesn't matter if you're a millennial, a Gen Z, Gen X, a baby boomer. When you ask people, what do you want from your work? What are your career goals? The number one thing they say is, I wanna have a positive impact on my organization. The number two thing they say is, I want to help solve social and or environmental challenges. So there is a new definition of career expectations. In fact, when I talk to HR people, they say, that's the number one question I get asked in an interview. What is your company doing, you know, not just from a CSR perspective, but to actively give me a chance to get involved in helping solve these challenges as well? So it is crucially important for companies to give their employees an opportunity to participate and actually, that's how innovation happens. That's how you can spark innovation amongst your employees, because once they link their personal passions to it, suddenly you have people who are operating at a higher gear. Um, they're showing up for yeah. work, and they want to come to work on a Monday morning because they realize that work can give them meaning, um, not just money. You know? And so the, the new definition, I think, of these companies that are doing it well is, is, is purpose and a paycheck. It's not either or, it's both. Oh. So last night at dinner, we talked about this continuum of, you know, 30 years ago it was philanthropy, it was about writing a check, and that moved into this idea of corporate social responsibility, and we're here today talking about sustainability and, and purpose. What's next? So the, the most helpful analogy um, that I found of, of how to think about where we are, I have to give full credit to my friend Max Lenderman, who runs an amazing agency called School in Boulder, Colorado. Please check out their work. Um, his analogy is companies need to think about purpose like they thought about digital. So if you think about the adoption curve of digital over the last 10, 20 years, um, 10 years ago, digital to a company was, we've got a website, we're cool, we're covered, this is digital. 
Um, five years ago, it may have been, hey, we have a Facebook page. We've got this social media thing happening. It's, it's cool. But today, it's impossible not to think about a single function within a company that doesn't have digital uh, embedded into it, whether it's your supply chain, your marketing, your, your, your product innovation. So similarly, we think there is like this a continuum where 10 years ago, doing good in a company was in the CSR department. Mm -hmm. That's where we do good. That box marks CSR. Five years ago, I think that's when sustainability started becoming uh, an essential part of any Fortune 500 company. I struggle to think of any, any major company that doesn't have a sustainability strategy in place. Um, where we're heading now is this really interesting place where it's all starting to kind of weave together. So uh, companies are now finding ways to use purpose as, as a kind of like an umbrella term to describe all this, um, to recruit and retain their employees, mm -hmm. as we talked about, to find new ways to do product innovation, mm -hmm. to find ways of doing their marketing in ways uh, you know, of taking a stand as well. And what's really interesting is, just like no company is going to say, hey, we're digital enough, we're going to stop innovating. We can't stop innovating with this space either. There is always going to be a new frontier where a company can do better, um, whether it's in its products, its supply chain, it's the way it treats its employees. Um, so that is what I think is really exciting about this moment in time. We're seeing a, a maturation of all of these things come together and kind of wake up and, and hopefully, you know, I, I'm maybe naively optimistic, but I do believe that it's kind of a way to reinvent capitalism for the many, not the few, uh, you know, and find this way of kind of making money long term in a sustainable way um, and, and really get to the next stage, which is, you know, uh, where you can use the engine of business to do good in the world. Great. Thank you. Well, we are at time. So thank you, Afdal, for joining us. Cool. And we will stay tuned for the next book. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, guys. Thank you.